Okay. Thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, Dr. Karaya joining me. She has an undergrad degree in aerospace engineering, which I thought was kind of cool, but she's now a psychiatrist and works with us in sexual medicine. Uh, we don't have any disclosures for this. So I want to talk about some of the pathology uh, that happens after you have a radical prostatectomy and understand what some of the, the controversies are around PDE5 inhibitors. Should we be giving them right away? What is, what is the data? And also talk about some of the medical and psychological approaches to these erectile difficulties. If we have time, we'll talk about the role of testosterone after prostate cancer treatment. If we don't have time, these slides are available for everybody. And uh, I'm sure uh, Larry and Martin can put that in uh, a little sentence, what the bottom line to that is. So uh, what's the incidence of ED following radical prostatectomy? I mean, we have to be very cautious when we see patients that we don't give them unrealistic expectations. Really, in the prostate cancer outcomes, about 60% reported uh, erectile dysfunction 18 months post-op, and about five-year follow-up, only like less than a third of them could get an, a spontaneous erection adequate for intercourse. In the CAFS year, only 20% of patients were um, uh, functional at one year post-op, and when we look at the robotic data, they do so show some improved potency rates, but only in the high volume clinics and those uh, surgeons that are doing a lot. So what's the pathology that behind that? Huh? Is that, is that control data or is it? It's about three studies, not all controlled, no. So um, you all know the anatomy of the penis, right? <laughs> it was a meta-analysis actually, yeah. Um, so the cross-section of the penis, you all know what that is, but if we look at one of the corpora cavernosa, we know that the smooth muscle is tonically contracted because it's under sympathetic tone. So when you get some sexual arousal and nitric oxide is released from the nerve endings, goes into the smooth muscle cell, it increases CGMP, which causes smooth muscle relaxation. You have a high pressure in the, in the intercavernosal um, area and that causes the tunica albuginea to stretch and pinch off the venous outflow. So this veno-occlusive mechanism is really key, especially after things such as ADT treatment where you cannot get a full erection and you're going to have this venous leak problem. So what is the pathology here? Well, you have your uh, nerve injury, sorry here, you have your nerve injury and your neuropraxia, then you get your loss of daily erections. Then you have some poor cavernosal um, oxygenation. So the hypoxic problem leads to TGF beta 1, and a cytokine, and endothelial 1, which is a potent vasoconstrictor. You also have some vascular injury from the accessory pudendals if they're harmed. And this um, enhances pro-apoptotic factors. So you lose your smooth muscle and pro-fibrotic factors. So you increase your collagen. So then you get collagen accumulation, you get smooth muscle apoptosis, you get fibrosis, and guess what? The whole penile structure changes uh, the architecture of it, and we start to get a decrease in the total volume of uh, tissue. So that leads to the cavernosal veno-occlusive dysfunction. And again, loss of erectile tissue, fibrosis, and that leads to ED. So what are some of the interoperative problems nerve-wise? Of course, there's neuropraxia, there's thermal injury, traction, and again, once you damage the nerve, collagen 1 and 3 start to increase, and that upregulates fibrogenic cytokines. Postoperatively, post neuropraxia causes that cavernosal damage, just on that downstream that we were talking about, and the muscle apoptosis and the secondary endothelial changes, and there's also a lot of work on inflammatory markers that go up after. So that reduces oxygenation. Without oxygen, then you do, do not get um, the fibrotic, you do get the fibrotic, the collagen buildup when your oxygen levels are low. So with nerve injury, it's the loss of nocturnal erections and increased sympathetic tone that seems to cause this hypoxia. There's also vascular injury, again the damage to that accessory pudendal, which in some men is quite a, quite a major uh, tributary to penile arterial flow, and then we get the venous leak that we showed. So we can see that on Doppler ultrasound and we can see it serially as the months go by that the fibrosis increases. They did some study in some rats and they're looking, trying to reduce the inflammatory changes in the oxidative stress by putting a tissue 
of sealing sheet on the dissected caverno cavernosal nerve, and in this rat study it seemed to have some improvement, but of course we haven't done a lot of work on humans yet. So what are the predictors? Obviously, if you spare the nerves, that's better. It looks like the more uh, surgeons operate, the better chances they have. They have reduced complication rates. If you're younger, if you have better baseline erectile function, if your tumor size is small, these are all associated with better erectile recovery. Again, men undergo uh, robotics are more likely to regain sexual function at one year post-op, but this is controversial. But the meta-analysis of um, uh, robotics compared to laparoscopic have shown only a trend in favor of the uh, robotics. So what about some of the specifics of robotics? <clears throat> Just in this uh, review that I looked at, because I'm not a surgeon, there doesn't seem to be any difference with extraperitoneal versus transperitoneal in terms of bilateral nerve sparing. There's very conflicting results, whether cautery versus non-cautery. There's papers that are pro and con. Same with whether there's traction free. Noli retrograde and interoperative cooling dissection have proven benefit and potency rates so far. What are some of the other function, other sexual functions? There's a higher risk of peronies. It's above normal rates. There's penile shortening. Uh, one fellow in the States did a study and he said the average is two to three centimeters after 12 months basically of not getting any erections. ADT increases the risk for venous leak by about threefold at six months. And of course, we have incontinence issues that interfere with sexual motivation. And there's really three types of sexual incontinence, and Marcy Diane, the pelvic floor therapist, has really helped me with this, because there's a spontaneous leak with sexual thought. So if a man's walking along the street, just the sexual thought, he will have a leak. That's very hard to treat with pelvic floor therapy. But there's also incontinence with sexual arousal. So as a man gets aroused, then he has some uh, leakage, but that is more amenable to pelvic floor therapy. And then we have climacteria, which is the release of urine at orgasm, and that's a separate issue. So what's the definition of penile rehab? It's any pharmacological agent or device that maximizes functional recovery. So we want to prevent the loss of smooth muscle, we want to limit the venous leak, and we want to maximize the chances of returning to pre-surgical function. So the goal is to improve the blood flow to the penis to improve oxygenation and facilitate preservation. So pre preservation is to keep um, safe from harm or injury. So that's very different. We're not trying to create something that's not there. We're just trying to mitigate the damage from the surgery. So the proactive goals are to have better earlier spontaneous recovery, whether or not the man is using PDE5 inhibitors. Decrease the level of intervention. Is there a way that we can shift the treatment? Can we take somebody who's got severe ED and make them more moderate ED? So that will change our erection therapies. We want to preserve the smooth muscle and the penile length. Now, sexual rehab is different than penile rehab. Yes, it includes penile rehab, but we're also dealing with issues around loss of ejaculate, orgasmic alterations and pain, incontinence and sexual incontinence, body image, anxiety, depression, grief, and disturbances in partner relationships. So that's very different than penile rehabilitation. And that's what we try to do at the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Program. But going back to penile rehab, what are the factors? There's patient selection. There's timing, because again, if you biopsy it, the fibrosis gets worse over time. And then we have all this management. And that's what we're going to review very briefly right here, including some of the new ones and including psychosocial um, issues. So timing. This study was done by um, John Mulhall in 2010. They took 84 bilateral nerve sparing radical prostatectomy patients. And they started rehab either under six months or over six months. And at two years, they found that the IAEF was 22 compared to 16. So basically, anything over 18, 19 is getting towards normal in IAEF. And even if they worked better to PD5 inhibitors than if they had started a later rehab group. Compliance with therapy, that's a real problem. With PD5 inhibitors, it's expensive. And they're not necessarily going to promote a sexual erection. So a lot of patients drop out. But we know that the nerve recovery is not just in the first year. It can be up to four years. So one study looked at 77 men after um, robotic, and they took PD-5 three times weekly. And about a third of them stopped therapy under two months. 
and 40% stop by six months. So part of our penile rehab is to decide what are the risk benefit cost ratio of somebody staying on PD5 therapy, which is expensive. That's different than intercavernosal injection, which I'll talk about in a minute. So what are some of the controversies around PD-5 inhibitors that we use as a penile rehab um, issue right after radicals or even brachytherapy? There's lots of animal data uh, preventing uh, post-op ED, histo histological functional benefits. They prevent the venoocclusive dysfunction. They preserve the smooth uh, muscle contact by activating genes. And they inhibit fibrosis by downregulating genes. And this sort of modulates uh, tissue growth factor gene expression. And this, it was over and over and over again, just similar with um, estrogen and breast cancer in mice and rodents. Lots of positive data. But nitric oxide has a paradoxal activity in regulated cancer growth. And you guys would know more about that than me. But there is a whole article on PD5 inhibitors and whether or not that is going to be a problem um, through the modulation of um, some signals. But there doesn't seem to be any, um, at least in studies, there's no increase in biochemical occurrence that's seen with PD-5 inhibitors and PD-5 use in this recent meta-analysis, and that was in 2016. What about PD uh, PD-5 trials in humans? So there's three large double-blind, randomized, uh, placebo-controlled studies, big studies that were done. And I'm not going to go through them all because the bottom line is the IIEF scores were slightly better, but they weren't necessarily clinically relevant. Padman Nathan study was stopped prematurely because the response rates were no better than spontaneous recovery. And the initial um, higher scores that they saw were lost after they did a drug free washout. So the patient selection is likely very critical, but at every AUA or every urological conference, there's always a pro versus con. PD-5 penile rehab debate. So the con is that there's strong level 5 evidence, but there's really no level 1 evidence to show the PD-5 inhibitors make a difference in spontaneous erection rates. But what's missing is data on uh, combination therapies. In other words, we don't know if you have an indirect method like PD-5 inhibitors plus a direct uh, method like ICI, whether or not that combination improves. So we've just looked at PD-5 inhibitors. The pro is that there's evidence for some improvement from early in intervention and that there's less fibrosis and uh, more intracorporeal muscle, smooth muscle, when you use the PDE5 inhibitor. So one study showed that if you have a very structured program for a year and a half, that the erections returned faster in those men that followed a rehab protocol. But there's also non-MD involvement in that. There was realistic expectations and there was some partner involvement. So it's really a mind-body thing. It's not just about what's happening to the architecture in the penis. These small studies that show benefit are, or the pro side, they're very small numbers, but they're statistically significant improvements, but they're very limited by design and potential bias. So really, in my sex med world and all the urologists that I work with, some are very pro, some are very con. And you have to make your own decision. So the great debate is that there's two camps. There's not enough level one evidence in humans, and there's people that feel it's harmful not to do something. And yet the smaller studies that are coming out now every day are showing more positive results. So the consensus is there's probably not uh, a missed window of opportunity. If you can't afford PD-5 inhibitors after surgery, or you don't take them, you're not going to be at some massive disadvantage compared to somebody that takes them. But any sort of method that increases oxygenation should be considered, even, va even a vacuum device. In the uh, Vardenafil study, even the men that masturbated, even with absolutely flaccid penises, had better results than those that did not do that at all. So what's the real goal? Are we trying to get back to baseline function? Are we trying to uh, get earlier return of spontaneous erections? Are we just trying to get men um, being able to use the least amount of intervention after their surgery. Because really, in our experience, the erectile dysfunction has changed. It's very rare that you see somebody who has exactly the same function. So we need to prepare men for that. The issues with penile rehab protocols, they're very labor-intensive. There's no standardization, high cost, high dropout rate. 
very unclear incomes, part outcomes, partly because there's no sort of set pattern. Everybody, every big center has their own protocols. No definition of an optimal regime. And we have to look at the balance worth to the patient for the potential benefit. And everybody has a different penile rehab, including us here. So what are some of the medical and psychological approaches? Well, you all know this slide that if you have sexual arousal, you're going to release some nitric oxide from the cavernosal nerve endering, which goes into the smooth muscle cell and increases CGMP. PD-5 inhibitors eat up CGMP. So that's a natural process. You inhibit that process, CGMP goes up. So all PD-5 inhibitors do is act as an amplifier. They just, they, you have to have nitric oxide for this to work, including uh, endothelial nitric oxide. That's why some of your patients with hyperlipidemia and smoking, etc., don't do as well because they don't have very much E nitric oxide. We also have a different way of relaxing the smooth muscle with prostaglandin, and that increases CAMP in the cell. So those two methods um, enhance the smooth muscle relaxation. So we've had a Viagra around for a long time now. It seems like it's PD-5 inhibitors are extremely safe. They have a nitrate contraindication, of course. But, uh, you know, they're being used for lots of things, including off-label. So um, lots of choices. We have the, the physical methods, obviously, which is just a vacuum device. You get uh, subatomic pressures, and that increases blood flow into the penis, which has interestingly got a fairly decent amount of uh, oxygen in it, even though there's a lot of venous blood drawn in. What about vacuum erected uh, devices for penile rehab? So in animal models, there is reduced inflammatory markers, there is reduced fibrosis, the penile function is better. If you just apply a vacuum device briefly, your corporal oxygenation goes up by 55%. It's inexpensive, it's not a medicine. If one study randomized 20 post bilateral nurse bearings to Tadalafil 20 milligrams three times a week with or without VED. So that's a combination therapy, and they showed 92% intercourse ability versus 57% um, down the road. So the actual length that happens, they're looking at using vacuum devices to try to improve or, or um, eliminate or decrease the amount of penile tissue loss, so improve the length. Those that used the vacuum device, they lost 0.6 centimeters, whereas those that didn't lost 1.82. So lots of studies showing better preservation of penile length and girth. And uh, the study problem for most of these is that they're very short. The protocols are short, three to nine months. Um, and unless you start getting better erections after that time, it might be a short, limited time. Intercavernal cell injections. Most studies are done on nerve sparing. Montorsi started this back in 1997. This is what started this whole penile rehab. He injected 27 men two to three times a week, one month after surgery. And at six months, compared to those who didn't get an erection, 67% had spontaneous erections, whereas 20% had no, um, who, who had no treatment did not. So that was like a signal. This wasn't a, a controlled trial. But it was very interesting that there seemed to be some indication that if you created erections, it would help with spontaneous recovery. Mulhall, he did a non-randomized comparative analysis, but with 132 men in 2005, he gave them injections three times a week for a month, a year and a half, and 52% was returned to normal functional erection versus 20 in the control group. When you talk to Malhal or read his paper, he said the biggest problem was getting men to be compliant with this um, intercavernal injection for that length of time. So the direct neurotransmitter delivery is your ICI. It's very effective. Um, when you have nerve damage, we have to be very careful through the amount that we inject. We usually only inject prostaglandin in the first year. I just tend not to use papaver and fentolinine. Uh, sorry, papaverin fentolamine in the first year, we tend not to use prostaglandin because of the penile aching. And same with the spongiosal delivery, that's PG1. Uh, guys after surgery are very sensitive to this. Um, it's less effective. You're putting it in the corporal spongiosum. It has to have retrograde venous flow to get in the corporal cavernosa. So it's not as effective as directly injecting it. But what happens when we use MUSE following RP? You have to use low doses. The 1,000 uh, micrograms that we use uh, for to try to get an erection is way too painful. 
One study in 2006 showed 56 men who used these low-dose MUs, 125 and 250, and 35 controls. The ability to achieve natural erection was 53 versus 11 percent. So there's something happening in terms of getting an erection there and oxygenation. Another study did 125 and 250 daily for a month post-op, and it showed increased corporal oxygen saturation on oximetry even though there was no increase in tumescence, penile erection. What about penile prosthesis? Obviously, this isn't rehab. You're destroying all the tissue. But there seems to be, um, a, in the states anyway, that they're not waiting so long to decide to put in a penile prosthesis. They're not waiting two, three, four years with failure of everything. That They're starting to push it in earlier so that the men get back to their function, probably to avoid these psychogenic effects. And they're also placing them with artificial sphincters. And from what I understand locally, that's not necessarily some, something people like to do because of the complications. But some centers are doing it in the States. So men like penile prosthesis that go that route because they get an instant erection like they used to before. There's no fuss or muss. It's, it's, not, um, it's spontaneous. It doesn't, it's more reliable. Um, so there is an argument for earlier penile implantation. But again, I think here in Vancouver, we really want to make sure we have failure of all other mess before we consider this as pretty invasive surgery. What about some new stuff? Some, um, if we look at the you know, penile erection reflex, um, Dana Ohl and his group decided, what if we try to enhance the afferent and efferent part of that reflex by putting them on a vibrator after um, radical prostatectomy? And does that improve anything in terms of erection? Does it improve anything in, co in terms of continence? Because obviously you're stimulating the pelvic floor with that too. So they gave men penile vibra stimulation, which is a very strong vibrator that we use for spinal cord, and they placed it on the frenulum every day pre-op uh, pre and for six weeks after catheter removal for a week pre-op. And at 12 months, they looked at the differences in IEF. And it was 53% for PVS, and it was 32% for controls, the continence rates were the same. There's the vibrator, the Ferticare. So this was a non-significant result, but there was a trend towards better erectile function. But they figured that really the short time that they had applied this vibrator was probably not enough. However, interestingly, the vibrator was quite acceptable to most men in terms of a penile therapy. What about low energy shockwave therapy? This is something that's um, you know, we were looking at in Vancouver, there's thermal and non-thermal effects of this ultrasound. It's the same thing. If it's high intensity, obviously that's what you use to, for uh, lithotripsy. But this low energy one and the mid energy, they use a lot in orthopedics for tendon repair, and that kind of thing. So the healing is still under investigation. It seems to upregulate cell proliferation and differentiation of mesenchymal cell or progenitor cell lines. So in animal models, and Tom Liu uh, showed this too, with appropriate acoustic dosages, in situ progenitor cell production is enhanced. So basically, this technology is used mainly to promote angiogenesis. And it's more effective for vasculogenic or diabetic type erectile dysfunction versus neuropraxic. And it improves erectile function in some of those men. So Vardy had a study two years ago. He took almost 60 men with vasculogenic ED that were not PD-5 responders in a randomized double-blind sham control study. So he had another, um, you know, just a handle without any um, uh, shockwave therapy coming out of it. And about 50% of them changed from PD-5 non-responders to responders. So that's the best data that we've had on this. Before, some of the other studies were not quite as encouraging. So it's not for post-radical prostatectomy as of yet, but they're also looking at that for chronic prostatitis and chronic pelvic pain syndromes, that there might be some help with that. What about stem cell therapy? If you inject stem cells directly into the penis, they fly away. They usually go back to the bone. So if you could retain them in the corporate cavernosal, so they can maybe maintain the penile architecture after cavernosal injury by promoting regeneration, prevention of fibrosis, they tried using acellular scaffolds containing stem cells after um, cavernosal nerve injury, but there was some regeneration of the nerve, but not of smooth muscle. 
Then they tried using low intensity pulsed ultrasound, which is a, a form of low energy shockwave therapy. And it suppresses adipogenesis and promotes osteogenesis of the mesenchymal stem cells. So it's shown that if you use that um, low energy shockwave therapy, that you can recruit some of these mesenchymal stem cells within I'm the sure corporal cavernosa as compared to sham controls. Sure. Okay, Tom, we talked about that at the so AUA. Then there's another really new keen thing, and that's this little nano shuttle, uh, nano shuttle magnetic nanoparticle set attached to adipose derived cells. And these, um, once you attach this little um, nano shuttle, they will migrate towards a magnet, whether it's in vivo or in vitro. So in, in um, rats, they took these regular adipose derived stem cells, they injected them, they injected the nano adipose cells without a magnet, and they injected nanopose adipose derived cells with a magnet. And the ones with the magnet, in other words, they were able to keep the cells within the corporal tissue by using this magnet. The intercavernosal pressure, mean arterial pressure, and smooth muscle actin, and platelet and endothelial adhesion molecules were all better. So there was an indication that if you could keep the stem cells within the penile tissues, that this may improve um, erectile function. This is all downstream thinking. We saw the, saw the damage at the bottom. What about upstream thinking? Is there anything that we can do to prevent or to help uh, regenerate the nerve up more upstream? Because once you damage the nerve, you get this interruption in communication and transportation of molecules, both antegrade and retrograde. You get demyelination, etc. So if you can return axonal regeneration and you get some successful re with nitric oxide release, is there something upstream we can do instead of dealing with the damage downstream? PD5s only deal with smooth muscle function. They don't help with neuro, um, neuro regeneration. So cavernosal regeneration, there's some novel factors to improve the neural glia interaction and delivering strategies for cavernosal repair. This is Caspase. I don't know if you guys use this for anything else. Um, this is an interesting one that just came out in um, Nature 2006. They did a crush injury in rats and ROE and ROE association protein kinase or ROC. That is increased um, in penile endothelial and smooth muscle cells hampering nerve generation after you crush the nerve. So it upregulates gene and protein expression and it also um, affects the major pelvic nerve ganglion and their um, distribution of this ROC. So if you inhibit ROC, it can prevent the upregulation and activation of caspase 3 in the major pelvic ganglions. It can decrease the dimer monomer uh, ratio of neuronal nitric oxide synthase protein, prevents the lowering of uh, nitric oxide synthase activity in the major pelvic ganglion, and it maintains that intercavernosal pressure in the non androgenic non-cholinergic mediated relaxation of the penis, which is very important, the nape nerves. So they're looking as this may be a way, if you inhibit ROC, that you can prevent post-prostatectomy ED. Other upstream uh, therapies that they're looking at, I can't even pronounce this, pogliatazone, I think. It's an anti-diabetic agent, and it's affecting some of the postganglionic neurons. It seems to protect smooth muscle function. Uh, we used to have a product called apomorphine that we use for erectile dysfunction, but it wasn't very good because it made men nauseated. Um, but that was mainly because of the inhibition of um, dopamine 2 pathways. So they're looking at increasing dopamine 4 over dopamine 2 to see if that induces erections. And the next in one is through this reducing uh, inflammatory markers and protection against fibrosis. So all these are being looked at um, in rat models. Getting back to reality, what can we do right here? We can also do some pelvic floor therapies. And if we randomize, the one study randomized 52 men for early post-op treatment and biofeedback for three months versus control. The control group is verbal instruction to contract the pelvic floor. And our pelvic floor physiotherapist thinks that most men are doing, 75% of men are doing kegels incorrectly. They're recruiting their abdomen, abdominal muscles instead of their pelvic floor muscles. So verbal instruction she's not great on. Biofeedback is very helpful for men to recognize when they're truly contracting their pelvic floor. And a year later, with the shin score um, above 20, in other words, fairly normal, um, about 50% compared to 12.5% um, had potency. 
So that seemed to be fairly significant. Another group looked at persistent erectile dysfunction after 12 months, and they found that pelvic floor um, muscle training three, uh, for three months helped more than no intervention, and that after they stopped, this was maintained for about 15 months, and it also helped climb bacteria. So we're going to talk a little bit about psychological therapies with Dr. Karaya because sexual function is really a mind-body phenomenon. Thanks. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm Dr. Kraya. I work along with Dr. Elliot at the BC Center for Sexual Medicine. We're located out at NUBC Hospital. And as Stacy just mentioned, um, basically it's really hard to separate the mind from the body when it comes to sexual functioning. Um, when we think about what sexual rehabilitation is, we have to really think that we're going to look at the whole person and not really the genitals. Because if your mind is distracted, worrying about your functioning, worrying about your performance, you're not going to have an optimal um, genital response, you're not going to have optimal levels of satisfaction at the end of an experience. So we try to help individuals and their partners move towards optimal <coughs> functioning and we follow a very biopsychosocial approach. Just to review some of um, the evidence out there supporting psychological therapies. So in randomized in a randomized trial looking at men post-radical prostatectomy, um, introduced to a cognitive behavioral stress management intervention for 10 weeks, they had improved sexual functioning um, following the counseling. But then we've also had shorter, uh, more brief interventions that don't quite, they show some benefits, but the benefits aren't maintained long term. So there really is a push that we need to have more intensive, a little bit longer interventions uh, to maintain some of the benefit. A lot of the research out there shows that if you can involve the partners, you have improved benefit as well. And then there's this incorporation of mindfulness. So what is mindfulness? It's a present moment, non-judgmental awareness and acceptance of your current experience just as it is. And this is something that's really kicked off in um, the psychological world because there's a lot of benefit in, with depression, with anxiety, with substance issues. Um, and we've now taken it into the world of oncology to see how it helps with patients with oncology. And also there's a lot of evidence supporting its use in pain management. Um, yeah, so it improves the mind-body connection, improves your sense of self, um, reduces pain, reduces stress, improves self-compassion. And in cancer patients in particular, there's an improved psychosocial adjustment to just having a diagnosis of cancer. In the breast and prostate cancer patients in particular, there's benefit in stress and fatigue, decreased rates of depression and anxiety, improved quality of life, and improved sleep. There's also been a lot of research done uh, out of Calgary looking at um, the benefits on some more objective biological markers and there's decreased levels of cortisol and improved or decreased systolic blood pressure in breast and prostate cancer patients after a eight week mindfulness intervention. You also have immune and cytokine changes, so decreased um, INF gamma and increased eosinophils and T-cell production of interleukin-4, and that really marks a shift from a pro-inflammatory environment or where there's more T-helper-1 uh, response to more of an anti-inflammatory environment. And again, we think that having an anti-inflammatory environment improves our cancer-fighting abilities. And these benefits from this particular um, study were maintained even after 12 months. Okay, so just a quick review. So at the BC Center for Sexual Medicine, we do integrate CBT and mindfulness, sorry, mindfulness approaches into our comprehensive sexual medicine approach. We treat both the patients and their partners um, and try to really provide this global um, treatment approach for patients with cancer. Um, we also, a little plug-in, we're running a mindfulness-based group for men with situational ED, so please do not hesitate to refer patients with situational ED to us. Um, and the other thing I should mention is that the Prostate Cancer Supportive Care Center is going to be starting up their own mindfulness uh, group as well, so you're going to have lots of options um, to help support patients. So when we come back to what are we going to do for our own penile or sexual rehab, um, there's really a lack of consensus, as I mentioned before, in the literature. We don't know which mod modalities, the timing, except it looks like early is good, how long we should treat. There's also seems to be um, a lot of, it's a softer science, the psychosocial literature, where they're really pushing for non-MD support. So whether it's a, a nurse, whether it's a sexual health, sexual health clinician, psychologist, 
to help reduce the anxiety and frustration around some of the sexual rehab. You know, we don't know how long to use non-surgical enhancement before going to a prosthesis and whether or not we can um, easily put a prosthesis in with a continent sling. So summary for penile rehab, do something versus nothing. That's at least my personal philosophy. You want to improve oxygenation early by sexual stimulation, vacuum, I don't care what it is, but try to get some um, tumescence, try to get some higher oxygen levels. Um, it looks like there's pretty good data that the vacuum device will preserve penile length, but you have to use this regularly, probably almost daily, even if it's for a short time. The other sort of take home is that patients not committed to PD5 therapy probably don't lose out in a significant way. And they really must have realistic expectations. I think Christine Zerowski, our sexual health clinician here, can attest to that. that to be um, really honest about what, what the penile or potency rates may be after surgery and to prepare them for that and to say that we can do something about that uh, really prevents a lot of the anger and the frustration around saying, well, you know, I thought it was going to be just fine. Stress uh, success includes taking a non-responder to a PD-5 inhibitor responder, and that's really important because a lot of patients can't afford PD-5 inhibitors or they don't want to do an in, in intracavernosal injection. So if you can get them from one modality to a lesser modality, that again is success. And I think we have to provide a very comprehensive and regulated program to show proper outcomes, and we're just starting to try to get proper data at PCSC so that we can show that. Sexual rehab, a little bit different. Uh, we want to integrate the programs for non penile side effects, and that's where in PCSC we do uh, look at the psychological grief and adjustment, the exercise, the diet, the incontinence, the ADT side effects. And I was talking to Chris uh, yesterday, and she said how grateful the patients are that we're taking this um, much broader approach, that they feel part of a family, that they feel cared about. And, you know, this is outside of the surgical room. And I think that's really important because I think our ability to keep patients on ED therapies and to integrate them back to a normal sexual life depends on this kind of encouragement and reduction in stress. Pelvic floor therapies, psychological therapies, partner inclusion, they really count in, in sexual rehab. And again, the use of non-MD um, clinicians that have expertise beyond what we have, I think, is very important.